Yeah, flash wipe. Hey everybody, we are back for yet another Q and A that we do uh, once every two weeks. You okay there, big guy? Yeah, I'm great. Oh, fantastic. I'm also pretty good. Um, we're <laughs> very excited to be here. We love doing these Q and A's. Uh, it feels like forever since the last one. Yeah, it does feel like it's been a while. Yeah, it feels it feels like it's been a while since we've seen you guys. So uh, thank you to everyone joining us. I see we have a bunch of people on now already asking a bunch of questions. Uh, so before we get into those, um, I guess I just want to quickly mention a few things off the top for those of you who are uh, new here uh -huh. uh, and haven't been to one of our streams before. There are some... Uh, if you are new, welcome. Welcome, obviously. Uh, yeah, good one. And then uh, next we want to uh, mention the idea of general questions versus very, 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 very specific questions to your fish. Uh, right off the bat, we'll let you guys know that while you can ask anything uh, aquatics related, uh, if it's a general question that he can kind of answer from his general knowledge, that's great. If it's very, very, very specific to your fish, like a problem your fish is having uh, without much context or photos or, or more information, it may be kind of tough for him to give you a 100% accurate or uh, helpful answer. Yeah, we usually want to, a little bit of a back and forth. We'll have questions for you if you're having problems with your tank, and uh, it's tough in this format to do that. So we've got a Wicked support team and a support yeah. email that will drop down there for you. And uh, if you are having some uh, serious issues, again, I'll try to field the question as best as I can. But if I need more information, I'll probably generalize and then throw that uh, throw back to that email so that we can get all the information we need to make sure we get your fish situation taken care of. Yes, for sure. Uh, so that's about it for that. Uh, make sure you guys, uh, after you've done this, if you haven't checked out our recent videos that we've released, we oh, have oh, a, a, oh. a couple React ones that are out now, which I know people have been uh, wanting more and more of. So we've got a couple React videos that we've released. Uh, you can check out our High Tech Planet Tank series. Yep. We have another episode of that one coming out uh, first thing next week. Uh, and then a more React. We just actually finished filming more React uh, right before the stream. Yep. So we've got several more React videos coming out, so make sure you check all that stuff out. They're good out. ones. Too. Yeah, yeah, we're excited for it. Um, uh, shenanigans everywhere. Oh, Lots of shenanigans. We can't be stopped. All of these shenanigans. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess with that said, we can kind of jump right into the, the, the Q&A. Oh, let's yeah. do it. All right, let's do it. Uh, oh, also, by the way, we didn't introduce you. This is Thomas. Yeah. Uh, I'm Brian. I, you it's actually on put the screen. names on It's the there. Screen. I just want to let you guys know. I want to acknowledge <laughs> it verbally. Yes. Uh, and now I can uh, actually remove that graphic altogether and we can... Um, move on with our lives. Move on with our lives. <laughs> okay. So uh, with that said, let's start with the very first uh, uh, guy I have in the chat here. The very first question. Uh, I have bought seed mix uh, from Amazon for my nano planted aquarium. Should I grow them in the tank itself or in another container? Which will be better? Really depends on what it is you're growing. So you say seed mix from Amazon, but I don't know what plants that, that might be. If they're carpeting plants, uh, I often opt to um, kind of grow them uh, immersed or in a dry setup as opposed to underwater. Uh, I find that they just take faster that way. But my, my experience with growing uh, from seed is quite limited. I usually just buy already started plants or tissue cultures. That's just how I jive. That's how you roll. So uh, yeah. But I, I would assume, unless it's a actually fully aquatic plant, that uh, doing it uh, a dry start would probably be best. And I don't mean not using water. I just mean not in an aquarium, but, you know, immersed rather than submersed. Right. right. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, next up, can I use a canister filter on a bottom drilled tank? Technically, yes, you can. And I've done it. Uh, there, There is a thing you have to consider though. So if your tank already has an overflow or a weir, some people call it, um, that is covering the holes on the bottom of the tank so that uh, the water has to travel up the weir and then down it in order to get to those holes, what you're gonna wanna do number one is take any stand pipes that are in that out and just have strainers at the bottom. Um, and from that point, uh, the return for the canister obviously has to go into the main portion of the aquarium. It can do that from behind the weir. If there are two holes, just have the return go up and then into the tank, that's fine. Um, but what will end up happening is the weir or the overflow box ends up becoming the sump. Uh, so the tank will be full of water and it's going to pour over that weir down inside of that weir and then the canister will be drawing water in from the bottom of that overflow box. Um, as it draws water from there, it's gonna spit it back into the tank which will fill the tank back up and then go back down into that overflow box. So as evaporation happens in the tank, it won't happen from within the aquarium, it'll happen behind that overflow box. So you have to make sure you keep it well topped up otherwise your canister filter will eventually start sucking air. 
If there is no weir and they're just holes in the bottom of the tank, you just make a slight pipe that comes above the gravel, put uh, a, a strainer on that, and then you're golden. You'll get regular evaporation from the entire tank. Cool. Answer! Booyah! Done. All right. Uh, I just want to mention as well, I'm seeing some people in the comments uh, wanting us to really, really answer their questions. We will get to it, but again, we should let you know that we answer them as in they order. come in. Yeah, in yeah. order, in sequence. So uh, we will get to it. Just uh, sit tight uh, and we will get to your stuff. We've got people from the UK here. People from, wow. People from Ontario. Yay! Pennsylvania. Nice. Uh, Nova Scotia. Woohoo! Uh, yeah, actually, funny <laughs> enough, it was one of one of the uh, the kids that's in my neighborhood uh, is telling me to look in my backyard right now because I think they're back there and they're watching as well. Which that's is hilarious. Pretty, pretty funny. Saying, "Look at my backyard." So, hey, <laughs> hey, Alex, how's it going, dude? And hi, Lucas. If you can see me, that's my kid. He's watching too. Uh, let's see, <laughs> Michigan, we have. Wow. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, no. New uh, Mexico. New Mexico. Uh, yeah, tons of. Tons of people. That's Thanks awesome. for coming out, yeah, guys. Thank you, everybody. Guys and gals. <laughs> okay, so next one uh, is... Now, I, I don't know if he asked another thing prior to this, and maybe the YouTube chat might have just uh, deleted it, uh, like might, may have just timed it out. Uh, so, but I'll ask what he has here, and hopefully that's enough. Okay. Uh, uh, width, 40 centimeters, or 15... Give me the inches, buddy. 15.75 inches. Yep. Uh, it is 10.24 inches high. Depth is 9.84 inches. Okay. These are my tank measurements. I don't have any par meters, but do you think my light is capable of growing plants in my seven gallon? Now here's the light specs. Three watts, fluorescent, 10,000 Kelvin, four white LEDs and two red LEDs. I asked this last week, but you guys weren't able to see it. Uh-huh. That's a tough um, Okay, so your tank, the, the thing I'm most concerned about is the height, and you're at almost 11 inches. I'll say right now, you're probably not going to be keeping any uh, really highlight plants, but unless you're getting into CO2 and stuff, you probably weren't planning on doing that anyways. Your lighting is definitely going to be sufficient for some low light plants like, uh, you know, Jungle Val or uh, Java Moss. Java Fern can tolerate low light levels like that. And so can Anubias. All kinds of Anubias are going to be just fine with that. So yeah, you can keep some plants. It's enough light for some plants. Just don't expect to keep red plants red or anything like that. That's probably not going to be quite enough light. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, planted aquariums. Roughly, how much substrate is needed to create the hills, valleys, and general scaping effect? Pounds per gallon, if you can give that. Uh, he's, got, he's got a 29 gallon using eco-complete, tight budget. Don't want to overbuy because his wife says he spends too much on fish as it is. T. <laughs> um, I've never gotten that complaint. No, of course. Why would you have? Nobody has ever talked to me about my spending on aquariums or pets in general. <laughs> oh, rain it in. Okay, so pounds per gallon uh, to be able to create good. Like, here's the thing. I don't know because what aquascaping effect you're trying to create and how many inches in different areas of the tank you are trying to achieve will completely and dramatically change my answer. Um, the good news is, I think on Carib Sea's website, they may tell you, and if not Carib Seas, um, Tropica maybe, but there are substrate calculators that you can get on uh, online that are very easy to come by. Uh, manufacturers' websites generally have them, and they'll tell you how much of an individual type of substrate, uh, how many pounds will create you know, whatever amount of inches, because not all substrates have the same weight. So although they may be similar, uh, like you'll find that um, pelleted dirt substrates tend to weigh a little bit less than like uh, s just regular gravel. Gravel is heavy. It is very dense stone, whereas that pelleted dirt is not as dense. Um, you may find that some substrates that are calcium carbonate, because they are very porous, will still be lighter than uh, gravel. So I don't really know. I'd like to give you a more direct answer, but I'm going to say you're probably going to be somewhere around... Like I typically on a 29, if I'm trying to create some hills, like six inches in the back to maybe two inches of the front, might be around 40 pounds, depends. Like it depends on what rock you put in there and how much that's gonna displace the gravel, like whatever structures you're putting in. It's really hard to say. I can't give you a straight answer because it's a complicated question. That's fair. Too many variables. Gotcha. Okay, well, we will unfortunately move on, Nicholas. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, next up, my wife got me some Mbuna for my birthday today. Aha, good good pronunciation. Thank you. Happy birthday. Um, Happy Bee Dizzle. Where would I get the aquascaping rocks they like? Um, Depends. Because uh, really, with Mbuna and any African cichlid, honestly, um, as long as there is rock structure in there, they're going to use it. So... 
you could use lava rock if you want or tougher rock or uh whatever rock floats your boat uh, a lot of people will go with something that is calcium carbonate you could use like a uh, reef type rock not live rock obviously but like um what's a like carob sea makes various types of reef rock that would work perfectly for that they're nice and, and white and bright and the fish will stand out quite well on it so i would probably go down that road uh, and use that reef rock personally but you can use whatever you like they'll they'll still just use it i mean i've set up cichlid tanks that literally just have artificial coral and artificial rock that those corals are mounted to and they love it they just want some place to call their own they just need some territory to be territorial over so yeah cool uh hey i want to know how many fish can you keep in a 30 gallon tank now that's some variables yeah uh like uh, a few dozen like tiny fish you could keep like uh 30 uh galaxy rasboras or you could keep maybe uh a couple of garamis you know full-size garamis oh here oh hold on there's further down here i'm seeing uh i have 15 tiger bar oh so he lists it out and i think he maybe uh. wants to know is it too much uh, yeah, it's just kind of separated into different no worries. things here. I have 15 tiger barbs and two albino Oscar and three rainbow sharks and one upside down cap. You're already way over. Which is five, you're, five inch. You're already way over. One pleco, one gold garami. Danios or guppies are good though. The Oscars shouldn't be in anything smaller than a 90. They're going to get massive. Um, tiger barbs, they get a decent size. 15 tiger barbs. Is that what it was? 15, uh, yeah, 15 in a 30 barbs, gallon yeah. is already too many fish. Uh, I'm... One thing is, I'll say right now, I'm always considering adult size. Yeah. Because that's what's important. They're all going to grow up. Baby fish don't stay babies. You don't want to stunt their growth. Uh, so, <laughs> rainbow sharks, again, that's way too many. They are big, nasty, mean fish. Um, upside down catfish, already five inch. Yeah, you over. You so far over, I don't even want to touch this question anymore. You need like a 125-gallon tank. That's what you need in your life for those fish right now. Yeah, we'll, just, we'll call it there and yeah. say time to upgrade. Yeah, yeah. You, okay. need, you, need, you need more tank. Uh, hey, guys. The addiction it, is real. <laughs> is it best to run my airstone uh, at night when I'm using CO2? Yes. Absolutely. Um, at night, shut off your CO2 and run an airstone is perfectly fine. Plants don't photosynthesize without light and they actually stop uptaking CO2 uh, when the light is off. So it makes perfect sense to aerate the water so the fish don't end up with an abundance of CO2 that could suffocate them. And plaques will, uh, plants will actually use some oxygen at night uh, through respiration. So yes, the answer is yes. So many, so many yes. All the yes. Uh, okay, uh, guys, make sure you hit that like button because we are uh, at the beginning of this stream, and so hitting that like button will help us out big time. Do you this. like it? Do you do you like? If you like, hit the like. Hit the like. <laughs> uh, how many fishes can I keep in a seventy-five gallon running on a canister filter? Ah, uh, one really big fish, or <laughs> seventy-five really small fish. It's there's a range. You're this to is say. is a very complicated <laughs> question um, because it depends entirely on what you're keeping, what the bio load of that particular species is. If you're keeping goldfish, they are messy, messy, messy. Same with large cichlid species. So obviously you'd be keeping less of them than you would have something like uh, galaxy resbora, zebra danios, uh, neon tetras, rummy nose tetras, uh, lamp eye killies. Like it's impossible for me to really say, but the the long story uh, short is. If you're keeping lots of small light bio load fish, you can keep plenty of them. You can, anywhere from 50 to 75, honestly. Um, if you're keeping really big, messy fish, you could literally be down for just one. Yeah, big, big range. Yeah, huge okay. range. It's a very popular question, but it's one of those ones where I generally just redirect people to figure out what kind of fish interest you the most. And then uh, once you know more about those fish, you'll start to understand more about stocking and what's going to be appropriate for your size tank because bio load has a lot to do with it. And it's experience that really lets you know when your bio load's getting too high uh, or what would be considered very high. But uh, some tricks just for everybody out there in case we get more questions like this. If it is a predatory fish, chances are it's going to have a very high bio load. They're eating uh, other fish and they're going to have big messy poops because of it. Um, goldfish, carp, and other fish like that, uh, koi, for instance, 
extremely messy, very high bio load. Um, African cichlids and most cichlids will have a reasonably high bio load, especially if they are medium to large cichlid. When we're looking at small fish, uh, things like mollies, platies, guppies, tetras, small tetras, piranhas are technically tetras, but they're messy as all heck. Um, that's when you, you can play a lot more with uh, your livestock and, and what the bio load's gonna, uh, you know, the amount of fish versus bio load. They're not super messy fish. They're pretty small. They have small digest digestive tracts. They're omnivorous. They eat all kinds of stuff. They just don't defecate as much, especially for their size. So uh, those are the kinds of considerations you're gonna be uh, thinking about when you're, when you're trying to decide how many fish is too much fish or uh, whether or not you can sneak in an extra one or whether or not you have to go buy a 125 gallon tank for those fish. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Uh, any recommendations? And this is one of the questions you get a lot. Recommended, what kind of fish should I get? But uh, recommendations uh, for beginner fish for a 10-gallon freshwater. Um, there's actually a fair amount of options, but I think I'm going to give you one option. That is one of my favorites. Technically, I guess it's two. I really like uh, guppies for beginners. They're very easy fish to keep. They have a lot of intrigue. They're, they come in tons of colors. Um, they're not aggressive. Uh, and if you decide to, you can easily get males and females and they will breed and you'll have a whole other aspect of the hobby that you can technically appreciate. Uh, if you want something a little bit, maybe has a little bit more interest than just your plain regular guppy, I'm a massive fan of endlers. Endlers guppies are a slightly smaller species of guppy. I think they're, although genetically, I think they're probably identical to uh, like within reason to just regular guppies. They are considered a separate species. Um, and they're just a lot of fun. They stay small. They do well in planet tanks. They do well in ornament tanks. They do well in general. Again, very easy to breed and very cute little fish. So yeah, those are my recommendations. Those two, but there's tons. There's lots and lots of stuff that'll fit. Lots of different small tetras will be fine in there. Um, even if you keep a sandy substrate, you could even do like a uh, pygmy quarry catfish as a, as a tank mate. Lots of stuff. Snails, shrimp, go nuts. Have fun. Figure out what you like. Go to the fish store, grab an employee, make them show you everything they got. <laughs> make them earn their money. Yeah! Uh, next up, I, that was very enthusiastic. <laughs> I'm jazzed up today. I just, bought I just had some apple pie and I'm just flying. <laughs> yeah, we didn't do tacos for Thomas, but we did do apple pie yeah, for Thomas. Yeah, Brian did give me apple pie today. Uh, I just bought a very tall Amazon Swords oh. a couple weeks ago and all of the new leaves on it are short and thin. Don't know why this is happening. Any suggestions? Uh, new leaves, when they start, if they have not fully grown in yet, can can stay that way for quite some time. Um, as they grow, they should develop further. But I mean, it takes time. Plants don't grow super, super fast. Some some species do, and it depends on the conditions. But uh, if they don't develop properly, then there might be something at play, but it's impossible for me to say what it is. It could be uh, lighting, it could be lack of CO2, it could be lack of specific fertilization elements, uh, whether it's potassium or phosphorus or nitrate or whatever. I don't know, manganese. It's hard to say. I'd have to actually see the leaves and do some further research depending on uh, how Amazon swords react to different things being deficient. But in most cases, uh, when it comes to swords and stuff like that, those first new leaves that come out, they just look pencily and thin and take a while to kind of fully grow into the leaf that they will become one day. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, this question got sent in to us. Uh, I wanted to feature it because they sent a little video along with it. Now, the video, I will warn you, it was shot uh, in the portrait mode. So for, just turn your head. Yeah, for some reason, the, the software won't, won't put it right. So you can still get a good look at the fish. But the question is, hi, Brian and Thomas. Just to ask uh, if you have any time during your questions thing, uh, could you please tell me what I bought with this little fish? So let me put it on screen here. You guys can have a look. Um so can you please tell me what I bought with this little fish? Uh, let me read it to you and then you can look. Uh, so she, I know it's a she because of her bottom fin thing, was in a tank with endlers and the assistant said she wasn't sure if she was a guppy or an endler as they put the guppy fry in with the endlers. So I bought her anyway because my daughter was in love and had already called her Button pre-purchase <laughs> and you can't not buy a fish once it's named. It's just bad juju. I think she's a guppy but aren't sure. Please help. Fran and Fran's mummy. So can you get a look at that? What do you think? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to see because it's a little, a little shaky, shaky. It's either a guppy or some other live bear. It could be a, a platy or a molly too, potentially. 
it's hard for me to say. So you but, really just expanded this mystery yeah, pool rather than yeah. narrow it down. Sorry, I can't narrow, narrow it down just yet. Um, to me, if I'm being honest, it kind of reminds me of a, a Molly, but it could easily just be a Guppy. And if it is female, that would explain why it doesn't really have any color or flamboyance to the tail yet. Uh, I would say it's not an Endler. It looks too big already to be an Endler. Uh, and if it was an Endler, it should be showing some other coloration by now. So, it, if, I mean, if you guys... In the, if, I had to, if I had to guess, it's... To be honest, if I had to guess between the two, for sure, it would be a female guppy. Yeah. But if, hey, listen, guys out there on in the chat, on the on the, on the feed here, if you guys have any suggestions for what you think it is, let us know. Such a velvety black. Yeah. Gosh, I like it. Really? Okay, cool. Well, uh, we weren't able to really uh, help out too much there, but uh, hopefully that helps somewhat. Uh, we'll move on to other questions it, now. It, it's tough with blurry videos yeah blurry shaky yeah, it is tough but you, you did your best i uh, and I'm, I'm it's probably it is probably just a female guppy i'm personally proud and of i say just a but i mean a beautiful black velvety female guppy named buttons 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 yeah uh i'm moving 40 miles away and my filter will be will be befriend off for some time turned off it says befriend, but maybe it won't turn. <laughs> uh, the, water, the water chemistry uh, at the new place is much harder. Any chance in saving my fish, or should I just uh, re rehome re them and start over? It's not your fault, Brian. Oh, it's not. I tried. It's just typing fast. Yeah, it happens. We all we all have typos. Don't worry. Um, okay, so you have a few options. You can get a for your car a uh, power inverter that will take from your cigarette port or a plug if it already has a plug. A lot of modern cars just have like 110 volt outlets right. now. Or whatever, if you're in Europe, it's a 220 volt outlet, whatever. Um, get an inverter if you don't already have an outlet in the car and then you can run a bucket uh, with an air stone and stuff and you can take your biomedia uh, from the filter and put it in there with the fish and stuff while you're in transport. Um, then when you set up the new, uh, reset up the tank, uh, you'll have biomedia that's still doing its job and the fish can go in it, etc. Your biggest challenge at that point is dealing with the, you're saying it's extremely hard by comparison. So dealing with the harder water uh, along with temperature. But that is doable. Uh, one thing you can do to get your fish used to that harder water now is slowly raise the hardness provided the species of fish that you have can s tolerate that if you have fish that will not tolerate a higher hardness uh, or higher dkh um, for your general hardness then you uh, you're not going to have a choice but to rehome them but if they are capable of dealing with a higher um, general hardness then just slowly raise the hardness in your tank right now until it reaches the same general hardness as the uh, new house that you're going to, then when you move, the only thing you're fighting is temperature. That's the only thing because you'll have, like I said, running water with the fish in the bucket during transport. Um, even though it's 40 hours, it's a long way to go. But as long as they've got oxygenation, they should be fine. You're obviously not going to feed during that time frame because you don't want to uh, cause any sort of buildup of ammonia in that bucket. You can also have a product like... Um, uh, ammo lock with you just in case ammonia does start to get out of hand you can drop some in it will temporarily bind uh, with the ammonia and make it non-toxic for uh, a time but yeah then then when you get there you're just worrying about temperature they'll already be used to hardness you can use a product called replenish uh, by Seachem um, that will allow you to raise the hardness in your aquarium it works really really well I actually use it because um, I use RO water uh, at the studio at my house with our tanks and uh, I don't want zero hardness going into the tanks so I adjust my RO water to have the uh, elements only the elements I want in it replenish has those like calcium and stuff um, and bring it up to where it should be for those species and that's how I do that so you can just use the exact same product to raise your hardness in your tank prior to this trip so that they get used to it uh, you want to raise it a very little bit at a time so I don't know how much time you have before you move doesn't say but I would raise it maybe a degree or two of hardness at most every week. If you don't have that much time, you can try to do it a little bit faster. But uh, at that point, it may be better to rehome your fish and then start anew. But good luck. Let us know how it goes. Best of luck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let us know how it goes. We'd love to, to hear, hear an update on that. Uh, next up, I'm new to the saltwater aquarium thing. Welcome. Uh, is it normal for firefish goby to completely disappear under the rocks? If they are nervous. I added two yesterday and I haven't seen them yet. Yeah, that's normal. Mm -hmm. they, they, they can be a little skittish. Um, as long as you see them somewhere in the tank, like you can locate them, 
that should be fine. They're also uh, notorious for jumping. Uh, a lot of saltwater fish species uh, have a bad habit of going straight up when they get startled. So if they get chased or anything like that, a lot of them will just jump and then go carpet surfing or laminate floor surfing or whatever floor you have surfing. Um, so you want to top on the tank if you don't have one. You can get uh, Red Sea Cells DIY mesh tops that you can make. We carry those. Uh, if you don't want to use glass because you want to keep the um, <clears throat> positive gas exchange, I personally always want that gas exchange, especially with salt water. So uh, use one of those Red Sea tops. You can make it fit your specific tank. They come in various uh, kit sizes and you can just chop down however you need to. Um, but yeah, check the floor around the tank too, just to make sure they didn't pop out. But no, it, it's pretty normal for a lot of uh, saltwater fish, especially like wrasses, um, small goby species, uh, blennies even, to just hide. They will just hide for a while and eventually may come out. I've had uh, fish that would hide on me for periods of time that were so long that by the time I saw it again, I was like, I thought you were dead, bro. Where have you been? <laughs> so yeah. But hopefully they come out for you soon if they're not already on the floor. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, can Oscars be kept with flower horns? I would not do that. I would not keep a flower horn, personally, with any other cichlids. Uh, I, I don't even like keeping Oscars with, with other big cichlids. I know some people like to keep large, large tanks with m multiple large cichlid species together. Right. And you can kind of, in the same way you do with African cichlids, kind of just have so many fish in there that nobody knows who to beat up anymore. And they kind of just... Nobody gets picked on in particular because there's so many fish. So you can do that, but I wouldn't um, personally. I wouldn't put a flower horn. I would keep them by themselves. They're they're just such a puppy dog to begin with. Like I wouldn't even bother sticking anything else in with them. Yeah, I love flower horns. Um, the, the one that we had at the office was just oh, so it was awesome, fun. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do I keep the outside glass clean from water spots and streaks? Uh, if you have a good solid top on your tank and you are careful with how you do it, you can use Windex. You would just face away from the aquarium and spray the Windex directly onto a paper towel and just wipe the glass of the tank. That can do it. Um, otherwise just use water and paper towels. That's all I do. I almost never use any kind of glass cleaner. On water the and paper towels and a little grease and yeah. you're good to go. Set this all. Well, I want to ask, uh, can I keep a Pleco in, in, in an Oscar tank? Probably. Um, you're probably going to aim for like a common pleco, something that will be big enough that they're not even going to attempt to put it in their mouths ever. Uh, and it should be fine. I've seen I've seen plecos in, in large cichlid tanks many, many, many times. They're uh, hard, <laughs> hard fish to ingest because they are armored and spiky and really good at not getting eaten. Um, but that said, anytime you add anything to a tank with big fish, you make sure that fish is going to be big enough not to get eaten by those big fish the second you put it in. It's also a good practice to do it while the lights are out. Uh, if you're dealing with diurnal fish or during the day, if you're dealing with nocturnal fish, um, so you're not introducing them during a period of time in which that fish would be most likely to try to take a swipe at them. Yep. Cool. Uh, do you have any advice for guppy breathing outdoors? No, I've never done that. Yeah. But... I would say just put some guppies in a suitable habitat. And they're going to do everything else for you. <laughs> it is almost a impossible to mess up situation. A happy guppy is a breeding guppy. That's good happy news. Guppy. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any guppy's a breeding guppy, unless it's dead. So that's your that's your piece of advice. Keep yeah, them happy. Keep them, keep them together and keep them happy. Yeah. Right. Have males and females, and you're not going to have a problem. All right, right on. How do I monitor and change pH in a freshwater tank? Monitor and change. Okay, so this is a, a slightly more complicated subject, um, only because affecting pH, there are multiple cogs in this uh, machine. So there's a, something uh, called buffering that happens. So in your aquarium, if you have a certain general hardness or carbonate hardness in the water, there is only so much you can change your pH uh, before it's just going to bounce back to where it naturally wants to be. So if you have like really high hardness, for instance, your pH is going to want to stay higher. The softer your water is, the lower your pH is, is capable of swinging. So what ends up happening is people will get like pH up and down, which are either uh, a specific acid or base to add to the water. And if you have really, really hard water and uh, there's a lot of carbonate hardness to that water, and you add pH down, because let's say your pH is around 7.8, but you want it at 6.5.
you can add pH down, which is an acid, until that pH goes down to 6.5. But without uh, continuously adding that acid, your pH will just come right back up to 7.8 because it's being buffered by the carbonate hardness of the water. I hope my chemistry's on today because uh, sometimes my brain don't work. But um, so essentially, unless you do something to soften the water as well or change the hardness, you're not going to be able to keep the pH low. You can bring it low temporarily, but it's going to want to come back up. The same thing happens in reverse. If you want a really high pH and you add a base, let's say your pH is sitting at 6.5 and you have a very low carbonate hardness in the tank and you want your pH at 8.4. Well, you can add all the base you want until you get it up to 8.4, but it's not going to stay there. It's going to naturally swing back down because there's no carbonate hardness to buffer the water and kind of keep it high. It's just going to, over time, come right back down to 6.5 or 6.0 or where, wherever it was to start with. So whenever you uh, change your pH, you want to get something that will not only affect the pH, or that's like an acid or a base, but will also buffer the water. So um, a lot of Seachem products will say like pH buffer 8 point whatever. It's not, not just going to change the pH, but it's also going to change the hardness respectively to wherever it needs to be in order to keep the pH where it is. Hopefully that is enough information for you to kind of deduce how you can change your pH. We should do like a whole episode on that one day. I think we're going to have to. We actually talked about the, this this new concept of maybe you know doing like a in this environment yeah. a lecture series where essentially I'm off camera and you you can kind of give your own little uh, lecture on any given topic and maybe have like a camera mounted above and have you kind of be able to write on a whiteboard and like draw little images like diagrams yeah. or something and you know it's something that we can do that's fairly simple to and straightforward and Thomas is aquatic master class yes I love it <laughs> and I, you guys would you guys watch those like a uh, master class let's say like a 15 to 30 minute who knows depending on the topic 15 to 30 minute video where Thomas just sits and kind of draws stuff out and talks to you about stuff it's nothing complicated but it's information I think it would be I think it'd be worth it I'd watch that master class um, I wouldn't. That's because watching myself is weird. You watch yourself all the time. I, 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 I assume. <laughs> Brian's in my house, by the way. Regularly. I, I picture you in bed just like, oh, this video is so He's good. hid cameras in my house. You must. No you're like, you're always like, Thomas, you, I know you do this. I know you like, do how this. do you know any? Okay, whatever. Why not? Brian's creeping me out. What did you put in my pot? <laughs> Stream over. <laughs> All right. I have an upside down catfish about five inches. He keeps rubbing his sides on something and now he has a white streaks from missing scales and skin. Aye. Is it harmful and is there anything I can do? Thanks from Montana. It's not awesome. Um, no. Is it possible he's getting like in and out of a spot that he prefers, but something's in the way that's very sharp. So he's constantly, he or she, I don't know, is constantly rubbing up against it. Because if that's the case, you can modify the space in which that catfish feels safe so that the thing that's injuring them when they're going in and out of that space is not there to do it anymore. Uh, fish tend to not be as bright as we'd like them to be. And uh, will often, if they like a specific spot, no matter how much older they get, I used to, like when I was a kid, I had this little barrel <coughs> ornament. And we had a pleco that insisted on being in it no matter how big it got. It got to the point where I wasn't even sure if it was ever gonna come out anymore. Like it was just this just like giant placo stuck. stuck in a barrel. Um, so yeah, they're, what I'm trying to say is they're not exactly super bright. So uh, they, they will potentially injure themselves just locomoting about and getting to where they want to be. So try to modify the space they live in to prevent that. Um, Melifix is uh, a pretty decent um, pseudo medication. It's not really medicine per se. It's not like a medication, like a uh, antibiotic or anything, but it, it is an antibacterial, um, uh, kind of like an oil basically that you can put in the water for the fish that will help coat their bodies and prevent infection. Uh, and it creates a bit of a, uh, like a slime coat layer for them, an artificial one that aids in healing. So Melifix would be something to put in there as long as there's no secondary infection already. That's a good way to prevent secondary infection. Pemafix is another one, but it's a little bit more specific to fungus rather than bacterial. And in this instance, I'd probably be more worried about a secondary bacterial infection. So yeah. All right. Uh, if you send us pictures to our support team and stuff, we can give you a better idea of what's actually going on. I'm just going off of your description. Yeah, let me link that guy in the in the chat again, just so you guys have that support email. I think that's the first one we got that was pretty specific. I think so. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. Um, next up, can I put a red tail shark in a 30-gallon? No. All by itself? No. 
No, just no. Okay. Don't do it. <laughs> cool. All by itself, even. Blech. They get pretty big. Uh, if you want to keep a red tail shark by itself, or a ruby shark, or a rainbow shark, any of those, um, I would say you're probably best off with a 55 gallon tank for, for those fish as an adult. They are pretty active and fly about quite a bit. Um, yeah. I wouldn't do it in the 30. All right. Ixnay on the Erdy Thay. Aquarium. Man, they're nasty fish. They're, yeah. they're pretty. I get why people like them. They're cool. They look cool, but they are mean. <laughs> All right. Uh, what gravel is best for a 10 gallon tropical? Whatever color you like the best, or if you're keeping plants, something specific for plants. Again, something else suited to taste rather than. Yeah. There's no, there's no there's right no answer right here. Yeah, answer. yeah. Here, here's what I will say. We just did a, a, a video on choosing substrate. Yes. Is it out already? Yeah, it is out. Let me find it. So actually. Brian will link that for you, and I give you a bunch of tidbits in there, but I'll break it down a little bit for you. Break it down. Um, standard pea gravel is like your go-to solution. So it comes in a variety of colors, whether it's natural or artificially coated, um, and it is very simple to work with. Gravel vacuums and every uh, maintenance device for cleaning gravel is basically based around pea gravel. So you're never gonna run into issues with keeping it clean being difficult. Uh, pea gravel is also small enough that, you know, it, it doesn't allow too much food to pass into it or through it. Uh, so most fish can get the food, uh, even if it lands on the bottom, whereas like river pebbles or something are bigger and it can get trapped and you'll never see it. Um, and then sand, uh, alternatively, like fine sand is very difficult to work with because you can't gravel vacuum it. You have to be very careful while you're vacuuming, otherwise you suck the sand out. It also shows everything because it sits on top of the sand, it won't go underneath, which could be a pro or a con depending on how you feel about that. Um, but uh, whatever color you want of standard pea gravel is my general recommendation. Or uh, watch that video on the gravel. It just goes further it. into detail and you can make an educated decision for yourself. Yep, just link that in the chat. So check that out after this. Uh, I want to quickly point out that Nikith Lal uh, sent us uh, 20 rupees, I think is that was what that is. Awesome! Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, no question or anything, uh, which I think is... Um, uh, oh, there's a question after that. Oh, oh, there, a nice, nice, nice one. Yeah, can you make a video on how to bag and transport fish? I think we can. And I think we should. I think we must. Okay. Yes. Thank you. For the 20 rupees, we will. I mean, yeah, how can we say no now? You're so generous. Thank you. Um, Jen, just for anyone who sees that, uh, our live streams are about an hour long. So if you have a really important question, we don't aren't going to get to it. If you do the super chat, we do kind of well, bump it yeah. up to the top. Uh, we'll just out, out right of appreciation for you, for you guys yeah, doing absolutely. that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Nikith Lal. And uh, yes, we will definitely do a video on how to properly bag and transport your fish. Can't guarantee when, but it'll happen. It will happen. We, you're going to be getting more fish in the near future for all these projects we have coming yeah, up. So maybe absolutely. that'll be a good time to, to uh, knock that one off. Uh, okay, let's see. Next one. Ooh. What to do if my aqua break just a little bit at the... Oh, my aquarium. If my aquarium breaks just a little bit at the bottom, what do you do? You replace it. Immediately. Yeah. Okay, so there's different kinds of breakage you can get on glass. Um, I'm assuming this means glass, but... One is called a shell chip. It is usually... Uh, superficial for the most part it is just a slight chip out of the corner of the glass is where you would usually get a shell chip and it looks like a shell like that is just popped out of the tank um, although in most cases that is not the end of an aquarium depending on how far that shell chip goes uh, into the actual glass and whether or not that shell chip has any residual cracks coming off of it will dictate whether or not that is a fatal crack for the tank for the most part it's okay <laughs> once you get a line a crack in the tank that is a line. That is the end. And the reason that is the end is because if you tap that, even with a spoon, um, or don't tap it and just wait for your tank to do all the uh, tapping through the uh, immense amount of pressure that the water puts on the panes of glass, it is gonna continue to travel. And that line could travel up, it could travel down, it could travel sideways. We don't know where it's going, they meander. <coughs> Worst case scenario, it's gonna travel the other end of that pane of glass. And then you're going to have two separate pieces of glass that are now being uh, just held together by the fact that they're attached to the same piece of silicone. And that will be a point of leak. And uh, worse is that when tanks crack like that and they're full, that panel usually explodes. It usually does just remain a crack. And if it explodes, then you're going to end up with the water all over your house and fish that are not, aren't going to survive. Uh, it's going to destroy everything in your home. Like, 
It's not good. So it's much better if that's the case that you just uh, take that tank down and replace the glass and uh, just start over. Um, it's not safe to have a crack tank. I will never advocate filling a crack tank or having a crack tank or not draining a tank the second you notice it has cracked. Um, I've seen far too much damage on people's homes to, uh, you know, feel remotely comfortable with that. Yeah. And the poor fish. The poor fish. So, yeah, immediately. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> next. Oh, uh, you mentioned having it with a spoon. And that reminded me. Like with an egg. Yes. Uh, but uh, you said spoon. And that reminded me of our, our React video that we released yesterday. Oh, yes. Uh, there's one tank in there that we're looking at. and Oh, I feel like I'm forgetting something. No, you went. You went. Is that a is that a spoon? <laughs> yeah. And it was like sticking into the into the substrate. And we're like, is it? Is that a fork? Why was it? You're like, if that's if that is, why is it there? And we had people comment yesterday saying some people will uh, take a cucumber or zucchini or something, stick it with a fork, and then yeah, drop, yeah, drop it in the it tank, the and then go get it after that. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe. Well, that would make just more to sense get, make sure it stays sunk. Yeah, exactly. It sinks it for for the guys. And and, and anyway, that that was a plausible solution. I thought I'd bring it up. That's cute. Yeah, yeah. So just, I mean, we've, there's all kinds of feeding tools that they make. So. <laughs> That are like guaranteed aquarium safe. So I don't know why I would use cutlery. But but, but there's hey. that that's a possible solution to our little mystery from our React video that's yesterday. Really funny. If you haven't checked it out, go back and check out yesterday's React video. You can see that. Uh, or maybe that little... they just find cutlery in the tank attractive. May you never know. We've seen crazier things. Uh, hey guys, just finished cleaning my tank. Loss of algae after a week away on vacation. Woo! Not really a question, but more of a. Well, awesome. Tank maintenance super important. Yep. Everybody, take a note. Yeah. Do your maintenance. We've got a lot of people asking about having what fish can I have in like thirteen gallon freshwater tank. You gave that you, you already kinda of gave some top answers for yeah. freshwater. My fish. my favorite answer to that question is go to your local fish store, grab an employee, take a look at everything they have that would fit in that tank, see what inspires you, find out as much information on that fish as possible and go from there. Yeah. That is like my favorite part of the hobby when I started was going to the store and just gawking at everything they had and uh kind of just being like, Oh, what if that and what if this and kinda of, it's so much fun. Don't just do what some bloke tells you to do. Take the long tour. Yeah. Have a look. Get inspired. Yeah. And do then it. and then send us photos for our reaction. Or series. just put guppies in there. <laughs> safe safe option, right? As a temporary, you know, okay, just see so if something and then yeah, okay. yeah, I'm just uh, can I keep two types of Corydoras in a three foot tank? A total of ten to twelve of them? Three foot. Potentially. I mean I'd probably stick with pygmy species if you're going to do that. Or I'd stick with one really nice species and have like a small group of them. Like sturbays are really, really nice in my opinion. I mean, it's like the Corydora. Somebody's probably going to get mad I said that. <laughs> but it is, as far as I'm concerned. A lot of angry fish out there right now. Yeah. Thomas. Why, why is that I'm, the one I'm, that I'm the I'm a Corydora. I'm a panda cory. Look at me. They're watching our show right now. Just so mad. I know. I like, I, I think lots of quarries. Uh, bronze laser quarries, is that what they're called? They're really slick too. Big fan. But sturbeys are like, pff, like he's, he's, he's just the quarry catfish. Yeah. It's the <laughs> quarry catfish. Trying to okay. change my mind. Uh, <laughs> right now. <laughs> we'll wait. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, guys. Good morning. Morning. Uh, are you going to go in depth about your CO2 setup in the high tech planted tank series? No. Just no. Yeah. Series done. Brian's we, like, we, we decided just to... Which the, the tank looks good at good, good, good enough. <laughs> um, so the episode that's coming out next for that Planet series is on CO2. Yeah. Um, breaking, breaking the news now. Um, so I do go into some depth uh, on the setup of CO2 and how to implement CO2 and why CO2 is important because obviously we want to talk about uh, why you'd even want it, not just, hey, do this. Um, but I think more importantly is I don't end up in the end of that episode, getting to, uh, you know, how to actually regulate the CO2 and implement it uh, in front of you. I don't do that. And I explain why in that video, but you're gonna have to watch that video when it comes out next week for, for the download on why I didn't get that CO2 a stream in right away. Some of you might be able to guess if you've set up planted tanks previously. So uh, go ahead, try and guess. We'll wait. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, I'm culturing grindle worms as my guppy food. Grindle worms? Gr grindle, it says. It says grindle worms. Is it grindle worms? I don't know. I don't know. know. <laughs> I've never heard of grindle worms. Anyways. All right. <clears throat> it sounds like, what was, that? was it the grindle worm or the, the, 
Sounds but, like something from Harry Potter. Yeah, Harry Potter, <laughs> like a new movie. Like, isn't Johnny Depp playing like Grindel? Gr- Grindel, Grindel, Grindel Farm or something? Yeah. Grindel Therm? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a really weird heater. Uh, I'm culturing <laughs> Grindel Worms as my guppy poop. Nice. Uh, usually. How many times should I feed my guppies with Grindle worms per week? No, See, idea. it is Grindle worms because they put it twice. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't wrong. know. I don't know what Grindle worms are. Lo- hold on. Also, love your hair, Thomas. Hey, from yay! Malaysia likes my hair. <laughs> I like Malaysia. I want to visit. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, moving, there, moving there now. I seriously. Um, I'm not entirely sure what Grindle worms are. If I'm being honest, it maybe that's a common name that I'm not aware of. But. Look. Uh, in general, if I was feeding live worms, like black worms or, or blood worms or something like that. This video is culturing Grindle worms. Oh, nice. Grindle worm care sheet. Oh. Almost like little nematodes or something. Oh, there you go. What's a scientific name? Grindle worms is not a scientific name. Right. Can't be. Scientific name. Uh, let's look in the actual. And, and oh. Petrius Bucolzi. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, I would feed probably no more than two or three times a week and then try to keep a staple f- uh, food on top of that, like a staple flake or whatever. But yeah, live foods tend to be messier, just in general. So I don't feed them as often, and I will always feed a staple food and then uh, supplement that with things like live foods and stuff where I can. Good on you, though, for culturing... Um, food for your yeah. uh, fish. That's really awesome. I, I When I keep dart frogs, I don't have any at the moment because I moved and I got rid of everything, but they have a lovely home. So I can't complain. I know the guy who has them, so maybe I'll get some babies from them at some point. And then but you can do your own food. Exactly. Well, I culture fruit flies. Like I make uh, fruit fly cultures. Right. Spring you tail. do that in the office with my desk right next to you and there was fruit flies occasionally walking around. They walking were leaving around. the enclosure. That's not my fault. That's fair. It was a frog's <laughs> fault. They were being diligent enough. Yeah, eat your food. Don't yeah, let yeah. it escape. <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, I would do springtail cultures um, and grow springtails. I would grow uh, fruit fly cultures and even go as far as doing um, uh, pill bugs as well. It's interesting. Yeah. Making your own, your own food. It is. It's, it's fun. Anyways. Anyway, uh, once again, Nikif Lal here has uh, given us another 20 rupees. Yay! Uh, and he says, I need help, Thomas. Sure. Uh, I'm from India, and okay. fish are so cheap in India. Like, mollies are like half a dollar for a pair. And one more thing I have an issue with is, is my top filter. It sticks when I switch it on and off. Uh, I think it's a problem with the impeller. Yep, Can I probably. replace it, or do I have to replace the full filter? It depends on the filter that you have. So most filters you can replace the impeller in like aqua clear for instance or anything else the impeller comes out because you have to be able to service it like do maintenance so if you're not already doing maintenance on your impeller definitely start uh once a month when you do your filter maintenance you should take it all apart scrub the little well that the impeller sits in inside the motor scrub the uh outside of the impeller itself make sure there's no biofilm on it because it creates heat over time it can create warping uh sometimes you crack the impeller magnet um but the biggest stress is just heat on the system and the more things that are on the outside of that well and impeller uh, magnet it's just going to create more and more heat so clean it all up once a month and you should be smooth sailing for a very long time they should last uh, years and years like you can have an impeller easily last a couple of years if you take really good care of it that said replacement impellers uh, should be available depends on the filter you have if you can't find it at a local store you can always check online but uh, it is one of the most common replaced parts other than o-rings when it comes to filters so should definitely be able to get another one so i would probably try that but it sounds like something's gone another thing that can happen actually if you can take the shaft out of the center of the impeller sometimes there's caps on the end of the shaft you should be able to get those off so that you can get the impeller off the shaft. Sometimes what happens is a hair or a uh, lint or something can get wrapped around the shaft between the shaft and the impeller and it can cause a lot of friction right there and can actually make the impeller uh, very difficult to spin which can cause that stoppage when you unplug it and plug it back in until you physically start spinning it with something. Um, it may just not have enough energy to get it spinning with that thing that's mucked the shaft up. So whatever muck is on the shaft, get it off and then uh, that may also help resolve that issue, and I hope it does for you. Cool. Um, I'm being told by my neighbor boy that there are no more Easter eggs in the backyard. There was an Easter egg hunt in the neighborhood today, and I think they brought some for the backyard, and now he says there's, there's no Easter eggs in my backyard. Oh. 
I will, I will steal your Easter egg. Uh, <laughs> next up, do I have to put stress, stress sign? Do I have to put stress sign everything I add a new fi- every, every time, time I, I add, add a new, new fish? fish? Hashtag beginner. Uh, no, but it doesn't hurt. Um, anytime you add new fish or anytime you do a water change, uh, adding a little bit of uh, bacterial additive is only going to help uh, stabilize and increase the population of bacteria in your filter. Um, it can only introduce new beneficial bacteria. The worst case scenario is that your bacterial population in the filter is already at max capacity, in which case you probably shouldn't be adding more fish. But um, it's rarely, rarely is that the case unless you've got way too many fish for that tank. Uh, so all you could potentially do is waste some bacteria. That's literally the worst thing that can happen you'd be hard pressed to put too much in and actually hurt your tank with it. So yeah, it's not a bad habit to have. And like I said, it can only help improve the filter. Like worst case scenario, it's just wasting bacteria, but more, more than likely you're just gonna help improve the bacterial populations in your, in your system. How do you uh, clean a tank and get waste out of a planted tank? Um, so there's a few ways to do it, but cleaning a tank in general we should just do a general maintenance video one day too. We do. I we have we, a maintenance one on one. Yeah, I know, but I, we could always do another one. A, re, a revamp, a revision, yeah, like a redux. Well, that one's more of like me standing there talking about everything. Well, no, you do like the water changes stuff, don't you? Maybe not. No, but I could do like uh, maintenance on one of my planet tanks, and that would answer this question too, at some point. Um, so usually it's just a, a combination of uh, removing algae from the glass and rock fixtures and stuff in the tank. I have a brush that I'll sometimes use if the algae is getting caked on the rocks, and I don't like it. Uh, I use an algae magnet for the outside of the tank. Um, I obviously have brushes and stuff that I use to clean out the uh, internal components of filters and stuff, especially the parts that are in the aquarium that can get algae in them if they're translucent, which my AquaClear is and sometimes does get a little bit dirty. Um, and then with water changes on the planet system, I will take the bell end up. The worst part is anybody from England hearing me say bell end. Anyways, taking the bell end of the gravel siphon and <laughs> hovering it over the plant. So I press it kind of into the plants, but not to crush them, just over them. So any trapped debris in and around the plants kind of, uh, kind of comes up and into the tube and then down the drain and then all the way around the tank. And I will press it to the surface of the uh, substrate if there are bare spots, but I don't press it in because I don't want to crush roots. I just want to get rid of anything that might be near the surface uh, that the plants aren't really utilizing at the moment because it's just sitting there being extra waste. So that's what I do with the planet tank. We'll do it in the video next time. For yeah. Sure. Cool. Uh, next up, I would really like to buy a bristlenose pleco for my 63 gallon, but at my local store, they won't sell more than one of them per tank. Are they right? No, not necessarily. I mean, for a 63 gallon, you wouldn't want more than a couple anyways, male, female pair perhaps. But uh, if that's their policy, then that's their policy. I, I would just go in with a trench coat one day and uh, uh, I don't know, like a s glasses and mustache the next day. Yeah. Yeah. That's what else? That's the only, so I think you should do that anyway. Even if you don't get, even if you decide, just don't buy anything, just keep showing up with different <laughs> stuff and see if they notice. Um, no, for that size tank, a pair of uh, bristle nose would not be an issue. You'd probably end up with breeding uh, behavior if they feel comfortable and you have a male and female pair. Uh, can I do a, a low tech planted bowl? Yeah, technically, I wouldn't put any fish in it personally. I'm not a fan of uh, filterless aquariums for no. fish. Bowls. I can't advocate that. But if you want to just do a plantscape in a bowl, super doable. I've seen some brilliant ones. Small pico tanks or, or bowls. Yeah, hundred percent. I've seen reefs in bowls. So no I would do inverts. Like you could do shrimp, I think, in a bowl pretty easily. They have a very low like oxygen demand compared to uh fish because they're so small, so they're not gonna like suck all the oxygen out of the water right away. Um yeah. No company has done like a uh, little miniaturized bowl heater, a uh, bowl filter, you know, something that's like, uh, I felt like technically will filter out the water and, and help with that, but allow you to also, you know, but there are very great, few yeah. fish small enough that, that you would could call, in there. Yeah, yeah, call okay, a bowl a sufficient amount of space. That's fair. Good point. So, yeah, I mean, some people do betas and bowls. I'm not a massive fan. No, of that, no, no. But... All right. Well, that's fair. Good point. 
Uh, all right, moving on. Yay! First time aquarium owner. Ha ha! Uh, I cycled my tank, and my water parameters are good. Congratulations! Two, two of my mollies have a large protruding bubble or bump on their belly. They're still active, but I can't figure out the issue. Any way you could help? I would have to see it, but if it's near their vent, it could just be their vent. But I, I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to see it. Like, are we talking like a, just a giant cyst hanging off the side of them? Are they just swollen, laden with, with bebes? Is their vent protruding because they're ready for the copulations? I don't know. Many questions. You'd have to send us a picture to our support team. Let's get a look at that. I just linked that in the chat. Let's so give you a hand. Email that to our support team and see what they can come up with. Uh, okay, let's see. Can you grow live plants with 20-gallon marine land bio wheel kit? Sure. <laughs> Sweet. That was easy. Stick to low, low light, uh, low tech plants like Anubias and Vowels and Java Moss and Java Fern. You'll be fine. Awesome. Uh, I have a 20 gallon light on my 13 gallon tank, but I can't seem to grow plants. I have sand substrate and my five gallon can grow plants fine. I don't use CO2. Anything I can do to make my plants stop dying? I don't know why your plants are dying. Um, it depends on the cause. So if it's happening happening rapidly, then there's something seriously wrong. If it's slow death over time, then they're just not able to photosynthesize whether uh, it's too much light and not enough CO2 and fertilization. So they're basically, you're, you're telling them to drive as fast as possible, but they don't have the gas, <laughs> then uh, you're just gonna burn them out. So we gotta look at what's wrong. You gotta, gotta figure out what the problem is. I can't really do it without talking to you. So support. Yeah, hit up our support and we'll we'll get you sorted out. Email them. Uh, I want to take this opportunity very quick for everyone who's uh, who's here with us to remind you that we are inching closer, ever so closer to our goal of a hundred thousand subscribers here on YouTube. I, I'm so glad you brought this up. Yes, we're we're pretty excited. Uh, we had this idea a while ago that you know we should once we hit hundred k do something to really show our subscribers our appreciation for all of their support. A big celebration. Yeah, celebration indeed. And we thought, what can we do to really to really do that? We thought, what do people really like? I mean, free stuff? Yeah, sometimes. Who likes free? Yeah, okay, well, let's see. Well, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll see what kind of free stuff we can, we can gather to then give away to our subscribers. Uh, and you've been putting in quite a bit of legwork on this. I've been uh, in touch with, um, like some of my favorite manufacturers uh, of aquarium products and reptile products uh, and vivarian products. And we have, uh, I've been, okay. So first off, let me say my goal is to get a hundred prizes and the ball is still rolling. And I am shocked at how close we already are to that number. We have more than already 60 prizes to give away. And we still have- Totaling thousands and thousands of dollars. Now, hold on, I wanna say, <laughs> We have 76 likes right now. If we get 100 likes, we'll tell you some of the things that we've got. If Yeah, if we can get 100 likes. 100 likes, we'll tell you some of the, the, the awesome things that we have got for One thing in particular from a company that I is very near and dear to my heart um, that I've been working with for a while that has helped me with mega builds and other things uh, was insanely generous for this giveaway. Yeah. And I'm super excited to tell you guys about it. We, so. got, we got the email. Thomas gets the email, it forwards it to me, and we're just like, yeah, both of us were like, yeah. awesome. Yeah. So it's going to be an insane giveaway. It's You're going to have a pretty good shot at getting a prize. Like The odds are better than any kind of lottery. lottery that ever. Like, it's it's, it's going to be really good like odds. Like we're thinking 100,000 people, right? If if 100,000 people have 100 prizes to potentially win, your odds are one in 1,000. Which, which is, doesn't sound, maybe doesn't sound great, but think of like- That's pretty impressive. That's pretty, that, those are great odds for, for these kind of giveaways. And there's a lot, a lot of really, really cool stuff. A huge range of things. Like we yeah. have some pretty big ticket stuff. We have, you know, more mid-range stuff that is yeah. very helpful to have. But we have small prize packs. We have large prize packs. We have some, uh, some generic stuff like uh, gift cards to give away and, from and, Big Al's. And one of the, the things that is uh, not really, uh, uh, it's not a product to give away, but, oh, but the idea yeah. the idea that we've given one away so far in the last couple months, uh, and we're going to start doing it uh, uh, hopefully a little more, we'll see, is a one-on-one -on -one call with Thomas over Skype for you to talk with him on your own. With You can show him your tanks, show talk to him about everything, show him problems you're having. Yeah, just like a personal one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one chat. And Thomas you, talks tanks with you. Yeah, like for your own tank. So uh, we're going to be giving some of those away in this as well. So we have a huge range of stuff that we're doing for when we hit the 100, 
thousand. So number one, we're almost at a hundred likes here, which is great. Once we get there, cool. we'll, we'll tell you what we more, got. Three more, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the biggest prize we have so far. B but here's the thing: is we have to get to a hundred thousand, and the sooner we get to a hundred thousand subscribers, the sooner we can trigger this giveaway and give you guys free stuff. Yes. So uh, if you want to help get us there, we need you to do anything you can: share our channel, share our content uh, everywhere on social, on Reddit, on on wherever, uh, when you watch our videos, like them, because the more people like our videos, the more other people get recommended and they see them, and then we grow. So anything you guys can do to help us reach that goal as fast as possible would be tremendously helpful. And then, giveaway triggered, you get free stuff, and it's amazing. So Guess what, Bri? We hit, oh, we're, we, we rocketed past now. All right, well, that's 105 likes, as promised. Oh, no, I think we're cutting out. Stream, oh, 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 cutting oh, out no, just kidding. Cut, okay, <laughs> okay, so okay. tell them, tell them, tell them. So, um... My friends over at uh, ProClear, if you don't know ProClear, uh, they were a part of the original 265 mega build we did. They make acrylic products like sumps. They also make aquariums and man, did they ever go uh, above and beyond here. So um, what ProClear has uh, graciously donated for this giveaway, which will pop off as soon as we hit 100K, is a 53 gallon, just wait for it, cylindrical acrylic aquarium kit that is tank stand canopy and sump filtration the full shebang yes that tank retails over 2200 us dollars just, and, that's, and that's just one prize yeah and that that's j just one prize they also gave us which is a separate prize that somebody can win is one of their uh brand new uh, four and what uh, four and one red line flex sumps. So they have this new uh, red line series of sumps. If you liked the uh, the sump that I used on the 265 mega build, it's like that sump, but has a bunch new features, a bunch of new features, and looks insanely slick. Yeah. It is a really cool sump. I I am so excited for whoever gets that 53 gallon tank. First of all, just so you know, cylindrical acrylic aquariums are really cool. Uh, they're very expensive which is why this 53 gallon tank is only, uh, or it's only 53 gallons, but it's a $2,200 price tag. It's because uh, acrylic manufacturing is expensive to do. Uh, it's extremely crystal clear as far as anything goes. It's clearer than glass, clearer than your highest clarity glass that I'm aware of. Um, and it's the sump that's in it is awesome too. It's a, it's a pro clear sump. I want to give it to somebody and just watch them set it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's going to be great. And that, again, that's just one, but we have a ton, that's a ton one of prizes. Prize. We, yeah. We've got prizes from uh, Polyp Labs uh, have given us some prizes. We've got prizes um, from Akamai. We've got prizes uh, from API. We've got, like, we have a bunch of people on board. Yeah. Uh, we'll tell you more about it when we start releasing videos on the, on the whole giveaway. But... Just to give you guys a little a taste of what's to come, it's it's incredible. Yeah, we have someone asking here, remind me how to enter. So you can't enter yet. We're giving you just a little taste, a little sneak peek into what you will be able to enter for, but we have to hit 100,000 subscribers before this giveaway gets triggered. Yeah. So you we need to get there. So uh, right now you can't enter, but you can do your part in <laughs> sharing everything and, and letting us know. Filter floss prize? Yes. No problem. <laughs> so, someone said, Thomas, I would lay eggs for you. <laughs> No, you no. Can, I have a coop full of chickens you can join if you'd like. <laughs> they lay eggs I think it's one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> Thomas, I'd lay, I'd lay, lay eggs, eggs for you. you. Um, <laughs> so yes, guys, uh, definitely what you can do is share our stuff everywhere to get us that 100,000 subscriber goal. And the sooner we do that, the, you know, if we reach that next week, Hey, giveaway time. If it's two months from now, well, you yep. have to wait two months. So anything you guys can do would help, obviously. Um, but that said, uh, I was also, by the way, uh, unrelated, I saw someone ask, how do people ask questions here for the Q&A? It's in the chat, and we go one by one in sequence from the very beginning one to all the way to the end. The sooner you get here, the better chance you have of having your question answered. If you super chat us, we uh, usually give you guys uh, the advantage and answer yeah. that question first because we really appreciate your patronage and helping support us so that we yeah. can keep doing this. Yeah, so uh, that is a great way to do it. Uh, with that said, uh, I think we have time for, we'll do one more question. I'll do one more one question. One more question coming up. Let me find, uh, this is the one. Uh, okay, sure, let's do this one. Um, since I put six auto sinkless catfish in my aquascape, I haven't needed to do any cleaning other than a weekly gravel vac. I don't even need to clean the glass anymore. They're amazing cleaners. That wasn't a question. That was just a thing. So we'll move on to a question. That now. is uh, awesome. I'm right. really glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we talked about pH. Didn't we have to raise it and change it in your tank? Did we talk about that? Yes. Okay. So not that one. <clears throat> uh, we did talk about that earlier in it. So toxic uh, aura 
if you rewatch this when it gets posted, I did talk uh, earlier on in the stream about pH and the yeah. uh, effects of changing pH and stuff. But just to answer your, your question a little bit on whether or not a lot of KH is bad, KH can, uh, could potentially be bad if there is a fish that thrives in uh, a low hardness or soft water setting. That is where having a high KH could be potentially bad. Uh, and having a high KH will bump your pH up just automatically. So. Cool. Let's do. We'll do one more fresh one. Uh, does Sirius Stone alter water chemistry? Technically, yes. Um, so it, it is a slightly uh, uh, limestone type stone. It's a weird way to say that. Good job, <laughs> Thomas. Um, most people report getting uh, a pH between seven and seven point five with it, which isn't bad considering that's neutral. Uh, but what happens is if you try to lower the pH for fish that want to be around 6 to 6.5, the Sirius stone uh, being a, a, a carbonate type stone is going to slowly um, uh, dis dissolve on, on a level. You'd never notice it happening, but what happens is it dissolves because the pH is lower and uh, adds more KH to the water and then raises the pH back up that way, it becomes more basic. So you'll be fighting it forever or you could just keep fish that prefer 7.0 to 7.5 and you'd be laughing. Cool. Uh, well, that's it. We're going to wrap it up there. Uh, we'll call it a day on another Q&A, but we'll be back in two weeks' time. Two weeks! Same fish time, same fish channel with another... Same fishy guy. Yeah, with, with uh, another Q&A. So, uh, again, we mentioned the sooner you get there, tw uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the sooner you get there and ask your question, the more chance we'll actually have to get to it, but we have so many that come through. It's just not always possible to get to them all, so sorry about that. Uh, with that said, we got more videos coming out this coming week and the next week and the next week and the next week, so make sure you watch those, like them. Uh, the more you do that, the faster we grow, and the faster we grow, we give away things, by the way. Uh, just saying. Um, yeah, what else, what else, what else? Um, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Uh, the usual stuff. Uh, hey, visit BigLSPets.com. If, if you need to pick stuff up, supporting us there always helps us uh, create more awesome videos. The, uh, the more you guys patronize, patronize us? That's technically the right term. I think it sounds bad because there's also don't patronize me. Anyway, the, the more you guys support us, the more pride is spiraling. I'm spiraling here. I'm gonna I'm gonna press the end button. Very no, soon. no, no, wait. Before, <laughs> if you guys want to see that 53 gallon tank, head over to uh, www.pro-clear.com. Um, pretty sure that's what it is. And uh, it's pro pro clear with a dash in the middle. And if sure. you check out uh, their aquariums that are available, you will see the 53 gallon. Um, cylindrical aquarium. It comes in either black or white, so winner's choice when we do give that away. You'll be able to pick the color even. It's awesome. Yes. Awesome. It's going to be so great. have a peek. Yes, do that. Uh, subscribe, like, all that stuff. Uh, I'm going to say nothing more other than uh, you say something. Keep on tanking!